I still even switch it myself. morning. Welcome to church this morning. Good to see all of you here. Let's worship the Lord together. Stand with us. Acts 4.12 says, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Where to So um, I just wanted to share a, a story about how um, for, so the camp is going to be, are you kidding? Really? <laughs> so the twins are going to be um, 11 this week, and 
for some of you that remember, I know Daryl and Melinda and some of you other guys remember me waddling around here extremely uncomfortably pregnant with them. Um, so it's hard to believe. But yesterday, we had an incident happen um, in my family. My brother and his girlfriend, their dog, ended up getting into some medication, needing to go to the emergency vet, um, asking for, he called me, he's like, Tori, if you believe still in the power of prayer, I need you to pray for her. Um, they don't have children of their own, th so this is their baby. Uh, they have they have two dogs, plus my brother's a canine officer, so um, they have three babies, fur babies. And so we prayed, and Daniel was very affected by this. But when we went after, um, after a little while, we prayed and asked Jesus. She needed different medication to help her. They couldn't find it at the emergency vet. Well, they actually got medication from a local NICU where his girlfriend works and so they went and they picked it up and that kind of stuff and so Daniel he was just blown away by God answering prayer and so the song that we just sang there is power in the name of Jesus it's it goes back to the Billy Graham quote saying um, you've never seen God but have you seen the wind no we've never seen the wind but we've seen the effects of the wind and um, so I just want to encourage each one of you, when we do call on that name of Jesus, there is power in that name. And even for an almost an, an almost 11-year-old young man to call on the name of Jesus, and he cares, God cares. He, if we care about it, God cares about it. So um, don't think that there's anything too trivial. Don't think that you can ever out-ask God for what your needs are. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these stairs of ropes, water for my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. Your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears. Yeah, it's like holy water on my skin. Dead men walking, slave to sin. I want to know about being born again. I need you. Oh, God, I need you. So take me to the riverside. Take me under, baptize. I need you. Oh, God, I need you. Your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears. Yeah, it's like holy water on my skin. On my skin. I don't want to abuse your grace, but God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace, but God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace, but God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace, but God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. 
your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears. Yeah, it's like holy water, your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears. Yeah, it's like holy Amen. Thankful for those words. Thankful for the promises contained therein. Hey, Courtney, you were sharing a minute ago about uh, how prayer from young people, how sometimes that could be so moving. I couldn't help but like reminisce in my own brain. Have you ever heard a child praying for you? Have you ever overheard that? It is such an amazing thing to be in the vicinity uh, of a child's prayer as they are praying for you. I remember a night at uh, my first pastorate where uh, the children on a Wednesday night, they were doing a prayer walk uh, around the sanctuary and the different points of the sanctuary. And they were praying by themselves over all these different things. There was kids walking up and down the pews, praying for the pews, uh, praying at the altar, praying over the piano, praying over, you know, anything and everything. And I just happened to go up there because I wanted to observe the kids praying uh, for their church. And I remember just slowly walking around and walking through the sanctuary and I, I got up on the stage, and there was a little boy. He was preschool aged. He was, he was probably about this height behind the pulpit. If anybody was over here, they wouldn't have been able to see him. But I remember he was back here, and he had his hands up on the pulpit. And he said, Jesus, I want you to bless my pastor, uh, Pastor Dave, as he reads the Bible to us. And I thought, oh, man, that, that's awesome. And to this day, I remember that prayer. And there are, so there's more off than not Sundays where... I go to stand behind the pulpit, and I still, almost every week, have that vision of this little preschooler praying over me as I read the Bible at that pulpit. So I think of that every week, and I'm affected by that, Courtney. That just really touched my heart, and it's touched my heart for life. So just thankful for a child's prayer. Amen? Well, it is good to see each and every one of you. we got a lot of things going on. I hope you had a chance to grab a worship folder. If you did not, get one on the way out. You can check out all the different things going on tonight. Uh, we are going to celebrate faith through baptism at the Sharando Pool. We've got several young people who are, have decided to make that decision to uh, publicly declare, declare their faith before their church family. So it's going to be an amazing time. And uh, don't forget, we got to have desserts, right? we got to have snacks. Well, we don't have to. It sure adds to the festivities, though. So uh, make sure you bring your snacks and uh, bring your own drinks and all that stuff. But as far as uh, plates and napkins, we will have that available for you. But uh, looking forward to that. 7 o'clock, Sharando Pool tonight. Next Sunday, I'm starting a membership class. There are several who have expressed interest in joining the church. That starts next Sunday during the Sunday school hour. And I'll let you take the bulletin and you can look through uh, all the other things. And you can mark your calendars accordingly. But before we go any further, I think we need to give this service to the Lord in prayer. Amen? Amen? Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, we just come before you. Lord, so thankful and so grateful for uh, your many blessings. Lord, when we think about just even a fraction of the blessings uh, that you bestow upon us so richly, Lord, we truly are a blessed people. And we want to just give you thanks today. Lord, we want to come together and, and celebrate you in this place today. Lord, we want to lift your name on high. We want to give you the praise. So, Lord, as we share this time together today, I know for a fact that your spirit is here, ready and waiting and willing to fill us up. What we need to do is just come before you empty so we can let you do the work within us. So, Lord, fill us to overflowing as we worship you today in spirit and in truth. And, Father, as we come before you, Lord, we want to lift up uh, various needs that might be represented uh, with uh, each one here today. Those watching online, we know that... Uh, uh, whether it's in our immediate family, whether it's ourselves, co-workers, friends, families, neighbors, the list goes on and on. We have so many who have needs. And Lord, we are, the, we are thankful today that you are the God who watches over and that you are the God who has compassion 
and you are constantly working in and through our lives. So, Father, we just want to pray that you would just touch each one, that you would intercede on each one's behalf. Lord, thankful for our guests and visitors today. I pray your richest blessings upon each one. And, Father, I'm just thankful for the time that we're going to share together. I want to thank you in advance for what you're going to do tonight at our baptism service, Father. And I'm thankful for these young people that have made these decisions in their faith. And, Father, I just pray for this hour and this time, Lord, come in a mighty way and press in on us. Overwhelm us with your presence. Lord, we just ask all these things in Jesus' name and all God's people say together, amen. Well, before I dismiss the kids, Miss Shannon, have you caught your breath? Shannon's had kind of a crazy morning. She was hoping to get here just in time, so she's got a special presentation to make at this time. Good morning, everybody. So uh, to go right along with what Courtney was saying, watching our young grow, I have known the twins since they were about three. So um, it's been amazing to watch them grow into these young men that are feisty and fun and fight for the Lord. And then we have little ones that, remember Tammy was pregnant with Isaac when I started attending church. And uh, as well as um, Amanda, with Amelia, and it's just been amazing to watch these kids grow into these little people that are just excited for God, excited for friendship. So um, on the, today we're going to promote them. So we have some kids that are going from children's church that are moving up to youth and got to do youth this morning, so they were super excited about that. Um, Daniel's already got a T-shirt on. He's like, i got to grow into this. And I'm like, hey, you're going to be able to, buddy. <laughs> um, so we're going to invite them up and just kind of love on them with a love clap this morning, and they're excited to hit the ground running. Um, so first and foremost is Mr. Isaac Yoder. Let's give him a round of applause. If you have um, enjoyed some time teaching in our classes, you've enjoyed getting to know these kids. They have amazing personalities. Isaac is awesome, aren't you, buddy? <laughs> it's okay to own that. You want to stay up here for a second, everybody? All right, and then one of our other children that are coming up to Children's Church is Amelia Burton. Come on up. And she's probably one of the feistiest girls we have in this church. They don't stand a chance against you, do they? <laughs> all right, and so since Remington always brags about being first, firstborn and all, you know, of the twins... We're going to let Daniel come up first this year to be nominated to youth. And yesterday I spent some time with Daniel, and he is such a compassionate heart. Um, the story of Daniel in the Bible is definitely Daniel's heart. He's a sweet boy. I was excited to hear that things were going good for the dog yesterday. If you have ever seen a child pray so hard for an animal, like if that doesn't show you faith in God, then I just don't know what does. He's awesome. And Remington, come on up, Remington. Remington is going to keep this entire church on its toes for the rest of our lives, aren't you, buddy? He also, though, has a big heart and loves. He just hides it. He's under that tough skin. I think he tries to keep up with Hunter too much, don't you? Yeah, but these kids are amazing. Be praying for them as they continue to grow, especially with school, middle school, and first grade, and just uh, be praying for them to continue to have a serving heart and love for God. Just um, be lifting them up. So let's give them a love clap this day and just all their hard work. All right. Good job, guys. Now, Hunter, they are officially youth, so you have to just get over it, buddy, okay? <laughs> just a quick story before I release the kids and what Shannon just said. Hunter came to me and asked, Pastor Dave, can you bring up the board meeting? Uh, about uh, kids staying another year or two in Sunday school. <laughs> not sure why he asked me, but maybe it was because his brothers were coming up. But just so you know, the board did not have that meeting. So, But uh, anyways, kids, if you are ready to come collect for missions and collect everybody's loose change, come get those cups and shake them down.
stand with us as we continue worshiping this morning. can see the waters raging at my feet. I can feel the breath of those surrounding me. I can hear the sound of nations rising up. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. I can walk down this dark and painful road, I can face every fear of the unknown. I can hear all God's children singing out. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave. The same power that commands the dead to wake lives in us, lives in us. The same power that moves mountains when he speaks. The same power that can calm a raging sea lives in us, lives in us. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave, the same power that commands the dead to wake, lives in us, lives in us. The same power that moves mountains when he speaks, 
Psalms 130 verse 5 says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to where I sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken.
You may be seated. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. kids you may be dismissed for junior church at this time um real quick uh that final song we just sang that that has become one of my favorite songs that we sing uh i'm thankful that jesus christ is my living hope and i'm thankful on your behalf that jesus christ is your living hope uh that song gets me all charged up and when we sing that i usually get a tear in my eye I'll get the goosebumps, which I like to call Holy Spirit gumps, bump gumps. <laughs> Mama said life was like a box of chocolates, never did know what she's going to get. But Holy Spirit bumps with the B. Um, and I don't know, if that song doesn't move you at all, we have a device in the back of the church that will shock your heart. <laughs> and if, if, if by a show of hands, if... If that song did not move you, Miss Courtney will come up here, and hey, we could bring you up here too, man, we could have a really good time. Tiffany and Courtney can save your life, and we could have a whole shocking experience here today, amen? So by a show of hands, if you're not moved by that last song, raise your hand so we can do this. Wow, it's unanimous. Everybody is moved by that song all of a sudden. But I am thankful that Jesus Christ is truly today my living hope and I'm thankful as we've been going through this just Jesus series it's hard to believe that we are moving into week four of August in our book this is what we're going to be looking at this next week if you have not got your copy I still have copies available we're two months into this whole year-long study I don't know about you but I am totally being moved by just living in Jesus studying Jesus focusing on Jesus. And the message this week is us realizing that Jesus is enough. We don't need anything else. Amen? In fact, I should probably just dismiss you. We kept you long enough last Sunday. I can give you an early out today. Would you like that? Thank you for not saying yes. Thank you for wanting to be in the Lord's house and hearing God's word today. See, you guys are enjoying soaking in the presence of Jesus. And that's what we're going to be looking at today, that Jesus is enough. But before we move forward with that, we've got to go back to our basis of Scripture uh, for the whole foundational month of Jesus as compassion, which comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 35 is where we begin. Jesus went through all the towns and all the villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness. Verse 36 says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And this whole concept of the month has been stemming from compassion. The compassion of Jesus is enough. Amen. Because when Jesus moves onto the scene of somebody's life, my life, and or your life, we do find that Jesus is enough in every department of our life. There's not a department of your life, there's not an area of your life where Jesus says, oh, I can't, I can't mess with that. <laughs> You're on your own. Aren't you thankful for a God who looks at us and does not say, You're on your own? I'm thankful for a God who chooses to actively be a part of my life. And not only that, every department of my life, Jesus chooses to be a part of. I love that. Catch the wording in that. He chooses. He volunteers on your behalf. I don't know about you, but Jesus 
is enough. There was a text of scripture that we looked at last week, Matthew chapter 14, um, starting in verse 13. Uh, we looked at this last week and we, we encamped ourselves a, around this whole compassionate side of Jesus when Jesus was moved into mourning because of the loss of his cousin, his closest confidant, his best friend, John the Baptist, after he was beheaded. When he wanted to just be alone, he could not be alone. Because the people followed, the people were always there. And we took a good hard look at this compassion of Jesus we had, when he had every right to stop and literally just mourn and be to himself. When the people came, he didn't say, go away, I'm mourning. He said, come on. And he took care of them. I'm thankful for the compassionate Jesus in my life. I am thankful that no matter what is going on, all around me, Jesus is always there. Jesus is enough. Feeding of the 5,000. Folks, that's a lot of food. And if you really look at the context of it, it's 5,000 plus. Wow. See, a lot of times that's overlooked. Jesus fed 5,000. No, it's 5,000 plus. Read it in its entirety there. Jesus is enough, even when we don't think there is enough. And aren't you thankful for Jesus today? Now, I want you to turn to the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 and 20. You will not see this in your just Jesus context this coming week. In fact, as I was praying through uh, this, this week of just Jesus and as I was studying the week ahead, uh, there was a couple verses that were just weighing heavily on my mind and I think this one just speaks louder, at least in the context that I felt the Lord was leading us to today. It helps us to get a, a, a true inventory, a true mental, spiritual inventory of what we think of the person of Jesus, how we believe in the person of Jesus, how we rest in the person of Jesus. So Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, we'll get there in just a minute. But first, we need to talk about uh, the world around us. Do you ever get the feeling in the world around you that there's no such thing as having enough? Do you think there's a general concept in people's beliefs and people's thinking that there just never seems to be enough in our world? Yeah, there's, there's constant pressure in our world all around us to just keep adding and adding and adding. You ever go to a restaurant? I want a cheeseburger, small Coke. Would you like fries with that? Ah, sure. Would you like to biggie size that? Duh. <laughs> you go to uh, check out at a department store. You got to go through the 20 question interview about taking on a credit card and all the things that credit card can offer you and what you can save. There's constant pressure to add, to add, to add, to add. And our foods, there's additives in our foods. Eh? We're, t we're digesting all of these things. Catch this. I read this in an article as I was reading about nutrition this week. Even though we often don't, not that I'm living it. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify that because I know some of you, when I said that, some of you are probably thinking, yeah, right. I really was, okay? Even though we often don't think about it, we constantly put additives inside of our bodies. They look like this. There's preservatives in bread and cheese to make them resistant to growth, to the growth of mold. There's food coloring and margarine to make it look like butter. Artificial sweeteners in sodas to make them calorie free. In our coffee, we often ask for a little blue packet or the yellow packet containing artificial sugars. These are all seemingly acceptable ingredients and there comes a point where adding to something actually subtracts from its value. This is coming straight from that article. Adding something takes away from its value. Additives often bring damaging side effects. And with that awareness, there is a growing movement to move back to products that are all natural. Companies are now making soda from real cane sugar because natural sugar is better for you than high fructose corn syrup or the chemicals that are found in diet soda. Let me tell you, if you are drinking diet soda, you have been embal slowly embalming yourself for years. 
And you're going to save your family some money when it comes time to the funeral process because you're halfway there. They won't have to use as much fluid. Study aspartame. Go ahead. It'll kind of freak you out. While this movement back to natural organic foods has happened in the world of food, it has not yet fully happened in the realm of faith. So obviously the article I read is coming from a Christian perspective. I want you to think about that. Let me say that again. While this movement back to natural organic roots has happened in the world of food, it has not yet fully happened in the realm of faith. You know what that reminded me of? I heard this really good preacher last week say something like this. Let's keep the main thing, the main thing, going back to the person of Jesus Christ. See, that's organic. That's the natural way it was supposed to be per God. Amen? Jesus being the main thing of our life. If we could just get back to Jesus instead of trying to force ourselves into an agenda that makes everybody happy. We need to get back to the main thing being the main thing. Now, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. I'll just go through 23, I think. I think we'll just add a little bit, a few more verses today. Extra credit to God. Everybody gets an A plus today. Y'all good with that? Therefore, do not let... Oh, I'm in the wrong. That's chapter 2. How about verse, how about chapter 1? The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything we might have this supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God, and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Verse 23 says, or continues that statement. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become another servant. I need to put my glasses back on. Become a servant. This is the most well-known passage, I believe, in the New Testament. And often, people will quote this as one of their favorites throughout the whole Bible because there is a declaration of who Jesus truly is. And really, if I wanted to put it all in a nutshell, I could just simply say, hey guys, this week, just Jesus, you're going to be looking at Jesus being enough I want you to read this scripture instead. Focus on this scripture, and you'll find out that Jesus is enough. Let's pray. Let's go home. I could just nutshell it all. This scripture scripture is the nutshell version of saying that Jesus is enough. In fact, it's one of the the high points of the New Testament. It's no exaggeration to say that this is one of the greatest paragraphs in the history of the world. I want you to mark that in your Bible. This is one of the greatest paragraphs ever written in the history of all time of the world. Jesus is enough. Say it with me. Jesus is enough. It is dense. It is dense with the foundation on all of compensating scripture that says Christ is the central figure of it all. Is Christ the central figure of your life? In this text... One of the problems that we see with the church of Colossians, if you study the background side of it, that Paul had to deal with was their worldly traditions that got in the way of a happening relationship with Jesus Christ. Worldly human stipulations that are associated with a faith. In the absence of strong teaching, in the absence of strong leadership, others had come along and they tried to add their own message. There's a problem in that. We don't add or take away from the truth of God. 
We don't add or take away from the truth of God. The Word of God stands by itself and it doesn't need our help. It doesn't need to be messed with. Amen? You can't just erase it to make it fit the way you choose to believe or it's not truth any longer. We need the truth of God to mold us, to shape us, and make us who we are today. These are the things that they would teach in the church of Colossians. Yes, yes, Jesus saves you, but you still need to follow the Jewish traditions of eating. Yes, Jesus saves you, but men, you still need to be circumcised. What they were doing was relying on an attachment that was man-made to the basic principles of the world, which is trust of virtue, trust of wisdom, love or nobility that is divorced from the true source of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. They were maintaining an attachment to the basic principles of the world, which is trust in virtue or wisdom or love or nobility. But it was divorced from its true source, Christ himself. Christ must be first in all. Christ first, amen? Can we all agree on that? When we're talking about the truth of God... God doesn't need us to come along and put an addendum to his word. He doesn't need us to add to his word. And he he doesn't say, well, brother or sister so-and-so is going to be joining your church or coming to your church, so I need you to to do a, a, a little erase here because I don't want them to be offended. See, here's the problem with truth. Truth offends. Truth offends. Amen? Ain't none of us in here likes to be told we're wrong. That's how we're offended. But if we're offended when truth comes along, well, that's how we know we got truth. Amen? And God's word is stockpiled. We can't just erase it to make it fit or write in a word to make it fit. That's the problem with our culture today. We have gotten away from the main thing being the main thing. Jesus, y'all agree with me? Jesus is the word? Here it is. Hello, Jesus. He doesn't need added or taking away from. In fact, the Bible, I believe, and I hope you do too, the Bible is the foremost authority. Yay, amen me on that? The Bible is the foremost authority in and all through all things. And sometimes, here's the problem, well, All the time in our culture today. Here's what's wrong with, maybe I put it in a nutshell, I don't know. Maybe I show you a picture of it. Here's the deal. We have this concept in in the world today that we can't share truth because it might hurt somebody or it might offend somebody. So what we try to do is we try to cram our truth into the word of God and make it fit. Now, I should have went to the preschool room or something today and looked for that one toy. Do you remember that one toy that drove you nuts when you were real little? It had all the different shapes. It was like a little octagon ball kind of thing. had all these different shapes, and you could fit like a plus sign inside of a plus, a square inside of a square, circle inside of a circle, diamond inside of a diamond. You get the gist. If you you get the right spot, it's going to fit. Well, here's the thing. God created this, okay? And... Let's just call this, let's just call this a circle because it's all encompassing of our life. So are you okay with me calling the Bible a circle right now? So what we are trying to do in culture today is jam a big fat square into a circle to make it fit our agendas. And it never works. Well, pastor, people are happy and blah, blah, blah. Well, it may work for a moment. But as we looked at last week, when Jesus comes like a thief in the night, that's when it's going to make a big difference. If you're trying to be that square jamming into a circle and you're against his truth, you're in trouble. I don't want to get too far ahead in my sermon. And the problem with our world today, we're trying to, we're trying to cram our truths and trying to cram our agendas into God's word when God's word is the standard and it's the unchanging standard Amen? Woe to the man who tries to add or take away from it. The problem in our culture today is this, they're trying to water this down. This does not need watered down. 
And you can't truly water, you can try to write a word in it, you can try to erase a word, and you can try to water it down, but it doesn't change the truth. Whew, I'm out of breath. We're going to do a little experiment today, all right? I'm going to take this Bible, and I'm going to just, we're going to see if it gets watered down. Okay, we're going to see, I'm going to pull this out at the end of the message, okay? And we'll see if I can read it, and we'll see if it works. We'll see if the truth has changed from what we started with. Y'all good with that? (sighs) Some of your faces right now. (laughs) Did he seriously just do that? I did. Guys, I got 52 plus Bibles in my office. If I lose one, I'm okay with it. Pastor, that's horrible. Can I just say this? Bear with me, okay? It's truly in water, okay? You all see that, right? Tammy Yoder just threw up a little bit in her throat, I could tell. She, <laughs> she is covering all her. She's about ready to come out of her skin there. But this is the foremost authority, and we truly can't. We can try to water down the truth, but it doesn't change the truth. Amen? Let's get back to our text real quick. Now, our text opens in a very powerful way, and I'm one of those that, as you know, I like different words, and I like to study just different words to see what it means within that text. And when you read a certain text and it has the same word over and over and over and over again, to me, that's telling us something with an emphasis. Amen? So, our text starts with, All these alls in the first five verses, or first three verses, you see five alls, A-L-L, alls. Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. In him, all things were created. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things. In him, all things hold together. Aren't you thankful? I'm the only one thankful. In Jesus, we find everything. In Jesus, we find our all in all. When we place our trust in Christ, he makes us complete, and we don't need more. When we place our trust in him, catch it, we don't need more. He is enough. Somebody say amen. Jesus is enough. We don't need Jesus plus tradition. We don't need Jesus plus money. We don't need Jesus plus all the right clothes. We don't need Jesus and all these other things, trappings of the world, the technology, the the greatest and latest and greatest thing. We just need Jesus in our lives. And when we let Jesus just be the only thing of our life, he is all we will ever need. When Jesus is enough, when we wrap our minds around that, and we truly believe that, and we truly soak in that, we realize we will no longer look for the things and stuff of this world that excite us. We no longer look for the next thrill. We no longer become bored from day to day. Life with Jesus is exciting. Amen? I made you a little list this week as I was going through some things. I thought, well, I think we should just take a, a, make a mental checklist. And I started dawdling here and there little things as I was kind of reliving the whole keeping the main thing, the main thing, and that being Jesus. And when I got to thinking about Jesus being enough and the main thing being the main thing, here's what we get. We get enough love when it's just Jesus. Amen? We get enough peace. We get enough strength. We get enough contentment. We get enough joy. When you're stressed out by the cares of life, Jesus, guess what, is enough. Aren't you glad? When your kids are having a let's drive mommy and daddy crazy day, Jesus is enough. When your neighbors are less than neighborly, guess what? Jesus is enough. When the news from your doctor is unsettling, Jesus is still enough. 
Guys, I've compiled a long list. When the next report of mass shootings hits the news, guess what? Jesus is enough. When life gets turned upside down, guess what? Jesus is enough. You may get bored halfway through this list, but I'm going to tell you right now, until we realize that Jesus is enough, you're never going to be content. I want to replace every anxiety that anybody has. Any thoughts that are dissatisfying in their minds, uh, thoughts, whatever, we've got to realize Jesus is enough. I know some of you are thinking right now, Pastor, that sounds good, but we're living in the real world. Jesus hasn't changed. Oh, I know the world around us is changing. Jesus never changes. Jesus never changes. Here's some things to think about. It's hard to focus on Jesus when it seems our nation is falling apart and our nation is screaming for attention. We still foolishly turn our focus on the economy and businesses all around us. It's hard to focus on Jesus when our nation's economy is screaming for attention. Let me again reassure you of this. Believing that Jesus is enough involves Resting in God's promises, no matter what is going on all around you. Folks, this is the difference maker. When we literally learn to rest in God and His promises, you find your peace and you find your joy. We have it all in Christ. We are made alive. Hey, even today we're, we're dead to our sins. Our book, Colossians. Verse 21, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you in the holy sight, holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, it says, established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Catch this today. Verse 23. If you continue in your faith. Oh, sorry, verse 22. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body on this cross through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith established and firm and do not move, from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. We've hinged upon these texts this whole month that has shown us that Jesus is enough. Let's remind ourselves of a very familiar text that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever shall believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. When you were living a life unlovable, when you were living a life that was steeped with sin, Jesus died on a cross long before you even started that cycle so that you could come before the Father and be redeemed. Tell me Jesus isn't enough. He gave of his very life so that you and I may live. I want us to look at that text once again in Colossians chapter 1, verse 22. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through the death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Just before that, in verse 21, it says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But because of the reconciliation through Jesus Christ, it goes on in verse 22, it says that we were presented as holy in God's sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is one of those areas where the text and where the whole concept of sin 
can become, I don't know, frustrating for some, offensive to some, let's use that word. Everybody's offended in our day and age. Amen? Truth. This is offensive to those who are perishing. Because it says here, once you were alienated from God and were made enemies. Verse 22 talks about the reconciliation that come through Christ's death on the cross. That death on the cross made us holy in the sight of God because we were redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But it says it's not a one and done. This is essentially what this is saying. It's not a one and done. You can't just say, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and choose to go live your life any way you darn well please. That is not what this is saying. Catch this. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is telling me that my faith journey has to continue. I've got to continue to trust. I've got to continue to hope. I've got to continue to move, think, speak, do all things to the Lord's glory. Amen? That's what keeps me holy and blameless before the Lord. You can't just talk the way you want to anymore when you come to Christ. You can't think the way you used to when you come to Christ. You can't do the things that you used to when you come to Christ. You have to allow yourself to be changed. Repentance is a complete turning away from. Jesus on a cross is more than enough. But it's enough to save your life. A saint's heaven is just as real as a sinner's hell. Let's just be real here today. There is a real heaven. There is a real hell. You either be a saint or you be a sinner. You either be alive or eternal death. The Bible refers to it as eternal damnation. Wow. Man, pastor. You went from happy to ugh. I'm passionate about heaven and hell. Here's what I want to see when I get there. All of you. Man, there's people sitting in churches all across the world today because it's Sunday. That's the day we worship. Unless you're Seventh-day Adventist and you meet on Saturday. Nonetheless, there's a lot of Christians who are sitting in churches today. A lot of people who are, they're raising their hands. They're singing the songs. They went to Sunday school. Hey, they have done all that they can to collect their fire insurance and good for you. But here's the deal. It comes down to the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You can't just walk in here and be Sammy the Saint one day and, or, or be uh, Sally the Sanctified and walk out on Monday through Saturday and take off your church face and then just go live the way that you want to. You may be fooling everybody around you. You might be fooling everybody at church when you gather. That doesn't make you a Christian. You know what that makes you? A good actor. If you do that for 30 years, if you practice that way for 30 years, if that's how you practice your faith, yeah, you look like a good Christian. You're just a good actor, though. Here's the deal. God knows your heart. You may be able to fool the people around you, you might be able to fool your brothers and sisters in Christ that meet see you on Sunday. But you ain't fooling God. He knows your every move. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, which is choosing to sin. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body. Jesus giving himself. For God so loved the world that whosoever shall believe in him. He presented himself for us on a cross. So that we could be presented holy in God's sight. Without blemish, free from accusation. If we continue in our faith. 
established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out into the gospel. You can't buy the lie of today's culture. God's word tells us so. The only thing we're to purchase is God's truth. We can't buy into the truth of our culture. That's the enemy lying to you. See, God's given us a truth and a standard to live by so we can join him one day, amen? He gave his son so that we could join him one day. The enemy's got free reign on the earth right now, and guess what? He's lying to everybody. Lying to everybody. And if you're buying the lie of curtain culture, guess what? You've bought into a lie, and the only place that's going to get you is straight to hell. Pastor's used hell three times in his sermon. Did you catch that, honey? We need to realize that hell is real. I mean, if you never choose Jesus Christ to be uh, the Lord and the Savior and the hope of your life, there's no hope for your eternity and you will go to hell. You have to buy into God. You don't even have to buy. It's free. The price has already been paid through the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask praise team to come and I know you had a song picked out for uh, the altar call, but I really think we need to sing Living Hope. So, something you're familiar with. Um, I think back to 1985 when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. In that moment, I realized that He is enough. Here's the deal. If you're, if you're buying the lie of current culture, I want you to, to renounce buying the lie of the world because that's the lie of the enemy. I want you to renounce that today by physically coming to these altars and just giving your whole self. Say, I renounce that. And Jesus, I want you to come into my life and be the Lord and Savior of my life. And if, and if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want this to be your day when you open your heart and you open your life to him and make a public profession of your faith. And maybe you're saying, well, if I go to that altar and I make that public profession of faith by coming to these altars today, everybody around me is going to know that I'm not perfect. Let me set your mind at ease. Nobody here today is perfect. We're all messed up. Amen? You may judge me and my jokes and laugh at me. You ain't normal either. The only thing that makes you normal, the only thing that makes you right is a right relationship with Jesus Christ. And we have to get away from the enemy gaining ground. Amen? Don't let the enemy gain ground in your life. Maybe today you're going to make that public profession for the first time. Maybe, just maybe, you've already accepted Christ and you, you think, well, I'm good. Well, if you've gotten away from him, you can come back to him today by a repenting spirit and say, Hey, Lord, I know 20 years ago I gave my life at an altar of prayer, but for 18 and a half of those 20 years, man, I've fallen off the Jesus wagon. And I just want to restore this right in front of my church family today. And I want to regain the joy of my salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever shall believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And I don't care what age you are today. You might be a child. You might be junior high. You might be high school. You might be college. You might be full-blown adult. This message is for everybody that is breathing today. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus. Today can be your day. And it might be your last opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Don't walk out of here not making that decision if you know the Lord's sticking his thumb in your back. Because I'm telling you right now, and I'm not trying to use it as a scare tactic, if you are not right with Jesus today, you are bound for a sinner's hell. Hell is real. Don't make the choice to go there. 
God gave you a choice when he gave his son Jesus. Don't pass on the gift. It'll be the greatest tragedy of your life. It'll be the greatest tragedy of your life. I'm not going to close the sermon yet. We're going to do that after the altar time. Because the Lord's pressing me on a few more things. But I just felt like we needed to stop right here and go to an altar of prayer. Somebody here today, I feel it. Halfway through, God has pressed me in the back and said, you better make sure there's an altar call today because somebody here today is struggling with their faith. I'm just being obedient. Here's my question. Will you be obedient enough to place yourself here where you need to find change and healing in your life? Stand as we sing. The altars are open. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. A 
All God's people say together, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I promised to get you out of here in just a a few moments, but God has just uh, placed a little something extra into my spirit. Tonight we are celebrating baptism. We are celebrating people's faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, I, I urge you and I encourage you to come out tonight and celebrate with our young people. Uh, we have a small little group of young people who are getting baptized and celebrating their faith. And maybe you've been considering, maybe you've been wondering whether you should or whatever. I, I just want you to uh, seek uh, God's direction in that today. If maybe you want to be baptized, just come join, be a part of that tonight as we celebrate faith. But I am just thankful for the victories that were at this altar today. And, and thankful for lives touched and thankful that God's word never ever returns void never and whoops ipad it's okay just had two drops on it we're going to conclude our experiment today look at tammy for effect I'm going to see if it still reads the same. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities of things were created by Him and for Him. He is before all things, in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so then, so that in everything he might have the supremacy for God. For God was pleased to have all the fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood on shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you have heard and has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Well, there you go. 40 minutes later, and the word hasn't changed a bit. God's word can't be diluted, amen? Especially when you have a waterproof Bible. (laughs) (laughs) Tammy is so happy now, aren't you? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come before you, Lord, thankful.
truly thankful, truly grateful for all your many wonderful blessings, but Lord, most of all for your son, Jesus. And Lord, today we had a physical picture of, of folks who just wanted to just give it all to you. And Father, I want everybody right now that, that was here as witnesses to be lifting up each of these individuals that were represented. And maybe, just maybe you just simply prayed from your your seat, and that's all right, too, because we serve a God who will meet you exactly where you're at. And, Father, we are so thankful that you are the constant in our lives. So, Father, we pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would just bless each life, Lord, that you would bless each family represented. And, Father, that you would go with us as we go from this place and encourage us and motivate us to be the salt and light to the world around us. And, Father, and to keep us safe and bring us back as we gather tonight at the Sharando Pool for a time of fellowship and a time of celebrating faith. Father, just be with us throughout our day. We love you. We praise you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name and all God's people say together, amen. amen. God bless you all. You all have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. Sometimes I think What will people say of me When I'm only just a memory When I'm home where my soul belongs Was I loved But no one else would show up 